This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Oh, man, that's a little bit of a problem. <laughs> okay, so it's a real pleasure to be here, and I want to bring to your attention a major question on the Megillah. This is a question that the Briskarov uh, mentions and asks, and he gives his own answer, and I believe in Hashemayim, they gave uh, Baruch Hashem, even in this generation, they give to the the Ketanim Shabiktanim some insights. You know, the Torah is a, an endless process. In every generation, Hashem gives new insight. Bechol um, Dar So we know the Megillah ends as follows. The Megillah tells us, not only were the Jews not killed by their enemies, not only did Klai Yisrael turn around and destroy Amalek and Shushan and the rest of the world, Says the Megillah, guess what? You know what the grand finale of the story is? I'm going to lean at Ashkenazi because I don't know any other way. The Megillah ends that Achashverosh taxed the people. Aren't you happy about that? Isn't that great information? Isn't that cause for celebration? You know this already? The Achashverosh taxed the people. First of all, what's this doing in the Megillah Bechlal? Why, why is this mentioned in the Megillah? Why do I need to know that Achashverosh taxed the people? I mean, this is not a history book. No details in the Megillah were written to give you a better appreciation for the context of the times, for the history. In fact, the very next Pasuk in the Megillah says, You want to know the political intrigue, the historical background, the context of the story? You got the wrong book. It's not in this book. You got to go to the Chronicles of Persia and Media. So what the Megillah is telling us is that the Megillah is telling us is that this book was written for one reason and one reason only, for Persume Nisa to publicize the miracle. That means every detail in the Megillah was written only to recognize the divine providence and the hand of Hashem. There's no information in this book that was written to get a better appreciation of the history of the times. And therefore, we have to ask ourselves, why does the Megillah include Vayasem HaMelech Achashverosh Masal HaOretz V'Ayam Why do I need to know that Achashverosh taxed the people? We're going to say Thursday night in the Al Hanisim Harabim You and your great mercy Heifarta Es You foiled their plot Vekelkalta Es Machshavtoi and you corrupted his scheme. That means the Rebbe Shalom did two things to Haman. We would have expected, what should God do to Haman? If there's an anti-Semite who's plotting to annihilate the Jewish people, we would expect God should take a lightning bolt, strike him dead, and then Haman would die, and that would be the end of him. But in the al we say God did more than that. He didn't just foil the plot of Haman. He didn't just nullify his plot. He was kelkalta es machshavtoi. He corrupted his scheme. This is the central theme of the story of Purim. I want to share with you three words of the Gemara Megillah. The Gemara is found on Dav Tezayin. And these three words will completely revolutionize our understanding of the Purim story. So the Pasuk says... You know, the king couldn't sleep. One night he couldn't sleep. You know why he couldn't sleep? The Medrash tells us, Malach Gavriel came, he took Achishosh's head, and he banged it against the floor 366 times. Bam! Bam! You know, I also find, personally, I find it very disturbing if an angel comes and bangs your head against the floor. It really, it's hard to get a good night's sleep if, if an angel comes and starts banging your head. And Achishosh said, what's going on? What's happening? And the angel said, did, you, did somebody do something good to you and you didn't reward them? And Achishosh is thinking, you know what, maybe you have to reward uh, Mordechai. And all of a sudden he hears walking in the courtyard. The king says, who's in the courtyard? And the Pesach says, Ve-haman ba. Haman was coming. Le'imar la'melech, to tell the king. Lislo says Mordechai, to hang Mordechai. al on the tree, listen carefully to these words. Asher heichin loy. Literally, that Haman prepared for him. That Haman prepared the tree for Mordechai. 
But the Gemara is bothered. Why does it have to say that Haman prepared it for him? Obviously, Haman prepared it for Mordechai. Just say, Al Ha'itz on the tree, Asher Heichin, that he prepared it. We don't need to say he prepared it for Mordechai. It's obvious. Says the Gemara, let me tell you what it means. Al Ha'itz Asher Heichin Loi Tana, interpreted as follows Loi Heichin. He prepared it for himself. Haman thought he was preparing it for Mordechai. Haman thought he's building the biggest gallows in history, 50 amos tall. According to Chazonish, this gallows is 100 feet tall in the air. He figured that, you know, this king Achashverosh, he's the most wishy-washy guy in the world. He doesn't know what he is. He doesn't know if he's a, one day he's a Democrat, the next day he's a Republican, one day he's a communist, the next day he's a, ca- a socialist, a capitalist, one day he's Russian, the next day he's Ukrainian. He doesn't know what he is, this guy. He switches back and forth and back and forth. So Haman figures he has to get Ahasuerus in a fit of rage. He'll get him angry at Mordechai. And in that fit of rage, when uh, Ahasuerus is angry at Mordechai, he'll see this monstrosity of a gallow staring him in the face. It's an eyesore. And he'll say, okay, hang Mordechai. Because he knows that if they, they have to start thinking what to do with Mordechai, by that time Achzeresh will change his mind 50 times. So he has to have this thing staring him in the face, so that the moment he gets angry, he'll just say, Haman will say, so hang Mordechai, and they'll hang Mordechai. And that exactly backfired against him. Because we know at the end of the story, Achzeresh is all angry, he doesn't know, he didn't realize that his, his wife was a Jew, and he takes a step, he goes outside into the, into the garden, and he's t- trying to take in fresh air, and he comes back, and the Pasuk says that Haman took a misstep with Esther, and he fell, al Hamita. he fell on the bed that Esther was on, and Achzeresh comes in, he says, are you kidding me? In the palace, in front of my eyes? And Chavonah says, you know what? Here, the gallows! So Achzeresh, in a fit of rage, said, okay, hang him. If the gallows wouldn't have been there and he would have had to think about it, I don't know, you know, a day later he may have changed his mind. So the whole plan of Haman was to catch Achashverosh in a fit of rage and that whole plan backfired, boomeranged right back at him and he brought about his own demise. Now this is the central principle in the Purim story, in the Megillah, throughout Chumash and throughout history and I'm going to give you a few examples. So there's this really adorable baby. Cutest kid. The only thing is, he's probably in the most precarious spot in the world. He's floating in a basket in the Nile River. In the Nile River, there are crocodiles. You know what a crocodile is? I was once in Phoenix. So we went to this uh, a zoo. They had white albino crocodiles. So let me tell you what this chaya could do. Crocodile could be here. The trainer is where, what's your name again? Leor. Leor is standing. The trainer is standing there with a stick, with a piece of basar on the stick. A, sh- a shawarma. The crocodile is like frozen. Like you don't, e- you don't even know if he's alive. The, the trainer goes like this. The crocodile from here jumps, ch- chops the meat, swallows the meat, and is back in his spot quicker than your eye could see it. All you hear is BAM! And you say, where's the meat? That's what a crocodile is. And when a crocodile sees a little child in the Nile, the crocodile eats the child. And you didn't even know there was a child. There's just going to be like a basket floating without a child. And that's what happened to the majority of Jewish children who were thrown into the Nile River who were floating in the river. And this little adorable child, Moshe, was about to be eaten by a crocodile. But then he was crying and there happened to be a lady bathing in the river. Now, she knew she can't take this Jewish child into her house because her father made a rule based on his astrological sign. He got a WhatsApp from his astrologer that today the Jewish Savior is going to be born. You have to kill all the Jewish boys. And Paro said today all the Jewish boys have to die in the Nile. But it was such a cute kid, adorable child. So she had Rachmanus on the kid. She takes the kid. Chazal say a miracle happened. Her arm grew. She took the kid, she brings him into the palace. She's, a, she's falling in love with the child, the adorable child. That night, 2 a.m., the child is crying, is crying. Paro says, hey Basio, what's the racket in the next room? Basio, well, you know, I have this really adorable child here, Dad. You know, I'm really tired, he's really keeping me up an hour. Would you mind holding him for an hour? 
So Paro comes out in his pajamas, he puts on his robe, he takes the kid, he's rocking this little Jewish child. And then at 3 a.m., Paro says, you know what, the kid is starving, we don't have any formula in the palace. So Basu said, do me a favor, Dad, go out to CVS and get him some formula. Paro said, I don't have any money. She said, don't worry, use your American Express card. And Faro, 3 a.m., goes out to CVS, gets the kid formula, then Basia registers him into, in the Egyptian Gan, in the nursery school. Who's paying for his tuition? The Pharaoh. Yeah. And then he grows up, and Ibn Ezra asks, why in the world did God have the leader of the Jewish people grow up in the house of Pharaoh? He should grow up with Klal Yisrael. He should go to Yeshiva, he should learn in uh, Mesifta, he should learn Toysvis with Rebel Hanan, with the Marsha and the Maram Shif. What's he growing up in the Egyptian house? Says Ibn Ezra, that if Moshe Rabbeinu would have grown up with the Jewish people, he never would have been a leader. Because the Jews were slaves, they had a slave mentality, they had low morale. And Moshe Rabbeinu would have grown up to be, you know, a schlepper. He had to be the leader, so he had to learn royalty, he had to learn leadership. So Pharaoh would say, Moshe would come home, and Moshe's tie would be a little crooked, and the Pharaoh would say, hey pal, straighten out your tie, you're going to be a leader one day. And Paro taught Moshe Rabbeinu how to be manhig, to be the leader of Klal Yisrael. Now Paro thought he was making a decree to destroy the leader of the Jewish people. Not only did he not destroy the leader of the Jewish people, Paro made, created, groomed the leader of the Jewish people. You know what it says in Perkei Avot? Paro kibel Torah misinai. Remember that? Yeah, Moshe. But who made Moshe? Paro made Moshe. Without Paro, we wouldn't be here today. Without Paro, we'd be here eating French fries. Because of Paro, we're here, we're learning Torah. Mm -hmm. Moshe Rabbeinu, Raya Mehemna, was created by Paro. Why? Because God says, you think Paro scares me? You give me Paro, I'll use Paro to save the Jewish people. That's how God works. God says, you give me the biggest anti-Semite. You think I need your man in Washington to help the Jewish people? You think only if the Jewish candidate wins, then it will be good for the Jews. Only if our man, as the Prime Minister of Israel, only we put in our guy, then it will be good for the Jews. You give me the biggest Russia, the biggest anti-Semite, in the White House, in the Prime Minister, it doesn't matter who it is, I use these puppets to bring Yeshuot for Klal So That's the way the Rebbe Shalom operates. Let me give you another example, then we'll come to Megillah, then we'll, I'll show you how this uh, appears uh, throughout history. There was a man by the name of Ovadia. Not Rabbi Ovadia Yosef, before him. The Navi Ovadia, the Prophet Ovadia. Prophet Ovadia said one nevuah in the Torah, one parak, one chapter. He prophesied about the downfall of Edom. Ask the Gemara in Sanhedrin, why does Ovadia prophesy about the downfall of Edom? Because he came from Edom. He descended from Edomite converts. So therefore he's going to prophesy about the downfall of Edom. Says the Gemara, this is the principle, Menei ube Abba, Nezel be Narga. In English we call it, from the forest itself comes the handle for the axe. Yeah? From the forest itself, comes the handle for the axe that will chop down the forest. God doesn't need to import the axe from China to, because then it would take like three months to get here. So Hashem has to, Hashem says, you give me the forest, from the forest itself will come the handle for the axe. Let me give you a few examples in the Megillah. So Haman made a decree, and uh, the decree was that on the 13th day of Adar, the governors, the officials, the mayors, the presidents will turn around and destroy their Jewish citizens. So the text of the document said, We're going to send out documents, They're all going to be knocked off on the 13th day of Adar. But the next verse says, Pas Shegen HaKisav, the text of the document. Mm-hmm. That was known in all the communities, that was revealed before all the nations. All the text said was, Be ready for that day. 
So let me explain. Haman sent two different documents. To the governors, he sent a document on the 13th of Adar. You're going to gather everyone together, you're going to arm them, and you're going to annihilate all your Jewish citizens. However, the, the posters and the signs that went up on every street corner, all the posters said was, be ready for the 13th day of Adar. And what's going to happen? Haman didn't say. Why didn't Haman say? Don't go anywhere. You're going to admit this good stuff. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> Haman didn't want to tell the citizens what's going to happen on the 13th day of Adar. Why not? Haman was a smart man. Haman thought to himself, if the Jews ever got wind of what's going to happen on the 13th day of Adar, if they knew what was in store for them, then they were going to do what we do best. They're going to go to their local governor, their local official, they're going to pull out their wallet, they're going to hand them green rectangles, and they're going to bribe their way out of it. So Haman did not want the Jewish people to know what was in store for them, otherwise they would uh, wiggle out of it, they would pay their way out of it. So Haman told, Haman told the governors what would happen, but he never legislated officially what's going to happen on the 13th day of Adar. All he wrote was, be ready on that day. Fast forward to the end of the story. So Esther tells the king, King, you wouldn't believe it. You know what my nationality is? He says, you're Syrian? No. Yeah, that's right. You're North Korean? You're not North Korean. You're Ukrainian? No. What, what are you? He said, I'm Jewish. And Haman wants to kill you? I was just, okay, that's it. He got really angry. And then Haman took the misstep with Esther. And Akshur said, let's hang Haman. And Esther said, okay, what's going to be with the Jews? Akshur said, you're going to be annihilated. She said, what? I thought, I thought you loved me. I love you, but what can I do? I already stamped the documents of Haman that you're going to be annihilated on the 13th day of Adar. Once I gave my word that you're going to be annihilated on the 13th day of Adar, I can't retract it. That's just the way it is. I can't take back. I can't rescind my decree. So Esther said, okay, I understand. I respect your honesty, but I just want to remind you what it said in the decree. So Akshur said, oh yeah, what did it say in the decree? It said nothing in the decree. It didn't say anything. It just said, be ready for the 13th day of Adar. Haman did not want to write in the decree what would happen because he didn't want us to know about it. So let's just reinterpret the decree that instead of you, us getting killed by the enemies, we'll turn around and kill our enemies. Akshur said, great idea. So Haman's whole plan backfired on him. He thought he would leave it empty. He thought it would be a blank check. So this way the Jews wouldn't figure out what would happen to him. What would happen to them. Turns out that he laid his own demise. Because he, he did it that way. And it came back to haunt him. Here's my almost favorite example in the Megillah. So Achazver has this wife. He wants her to display herself. She doesn't listen. So he's stuck. What, what do you do if you're the king of the world and your wife doesn't listen? What do you do? Next. You make a chasana tomorrow. You make another chasana the next day. So knock her off. But Achshir doesn't do that. What does he do? He asks the chachamim yoidei ho'itim. He has to ask his advisors. Isn't that odd? You, do you think any emperor of the world ever asked their advisor what to do with their wife? You think... Uh, King Henry ever asked his advisors? What, you think Alexander the Great ever asked his advisors? You think Stalin ever asked anybody their opinion? Of course not. So what's Achishver doing? Asking advisors. The Megillah explains. The Megillah says, Ki divar ha-melech. The law in Persia was that even though the king could always call his own shots and make his own decisions, nevertheless, whenever it was relevant to the king himself, he had to ask the advice of his advisors. He could decide anything in the world unilaterally. But whenever it was relevant to him, he had to ask the advice of his Congress. Really? Fast forward to the end of the story. Remember the end of the story? So Achzur steps out of the palace, he's fuming at Haman, and then he comes back into the palace, and he sees the unspeakable. Haman had the audacity, the Haman noifel al hamita asher aleha. And Achzer says, Hagam imi You're doing this in front of my eyes? 
So what does Charvona tell Achashverosh? To Lulav, hang him. So what does Achashverosh do? He hangs him. How can he hang him? Why doesn't he have to ask the advice of his Congress? Why by Vashti he had to ask the Congress? And with Haman he doesn't have to ask anybody. Double standard. Says the Vilna Gain. That's because the law in Persia changed. Because when Achashverosh didn't know what to do with Vashti, a man walked in and the Pasuk says, Vayoimer Memuchan. Memuchan said, Vashti is not sitting against you. Vashti has now insulted every husband in the world. From now on, we're going to um, uh, legislate a new law. Do you know what kind of lunacy this is? That you're the king of the world and you can't decide what to do with your wife? From now on, Yitzay Dvar Malchus Milofanov. From now on, you call all the shots. You make all the decisions on your own. Who's Memuchan? Haman. Why is Haman telling Achshirs to call all the shots? Because he wants to empower Haman because he couldn't stand Vashti because Vashti and Mrs. Haman did not get along. Vashti didn't invite Mrs. Haman to the party. So Haman thought he would be advancing his own cause by legislating in Persia that the king calls all the shots. Little did he know that later on in the story when he takes the misstep and Achshirs doesn't know what to do with him, he doesn't have to ask anybody. Who do we have to thank for Achshirs being able to knock off Haman and not ask anybody? Haman. Haman made his own bed. And I want to share with you, and I say this a lot, this is like my favorite idea on the Megillah, it's Matanam and Hashamayim. So I was learning Sefer Ezra, and in Sefer Ezra we read about how at the end of the 70 years of Galas Babel, the Jews finally return, they go back to the Holy Land, and what do they want to do? They want to build the Beit HaMikdash. So they turn to the king. Who's the king of Persia at the time? Anybody know? King Henry. King George. Achashverosh. He's dead. Who? Daryavesh. Very good. Give him an extra sandwich. Daryavesh. Darius. What? I'll take it myself. Daryavesh. And they say, Darius. Do us a favor. Help us build the temple. Darius said, what, what do you want from me? They said, we want money. So he said, make a charity campaign. You know, send it out to people. Make, they said, they didn't invent that yet. How are we going to get money? So Darius said, you know what? I'll do you a favor. Says the Pasuk in Ezra. Darius opened up the treasury of the king and he gave the Jews all the tax money to build the second Beit HaMikdash. And I ask you one simple question. Where did Darius get all this tax money from? And the answer is, He got the tax money from all the taxes that his dad charged all the kingdoms under his auspices. Achzir taxed the people. It went into his treasury. Achzir died. Darius inherited. He gave all the money back to the Jewish people to fund the second Beis HaMikdash. So now we understand how the Purim story has come full circle. The story begins that Achashosh is having a party. What's he celebrating? Seventy years are up and the temple isn't built. And if the temple is not built now, the temple will never be rebuilt. Achashosh was eating spare ribs. He was drinking wine, celebrating the fact that the temple would never be rebuilt. By the end of the Purim story... Not only will the temple be rebuilt, Achashverosh has become the chief fundraiser to build, the sponsor. This Beis HaMikdash is dedicated Le'ilah Nishmas Achashverosh's mother and father. Uh, they be Gehenim Tehemenu Chasam. Achashverosh became the chief fundraiser of the second Beis HaMikdash. Now, but let's take it a step deeper. The story begins, Achashverosh is having a party. So CNN came to interview Achashverosh and they said, Achashverosh, what are you celebrating? Achashverosh said, I'm celebrating the eternal ruination of the Jewish temple. And we're going to eat here and we're going to be merry and we're going to cause the Jews to sin and we're going to use their kalim and their temple will never be rebuilt. 
And God is laughing. God's saying, fake news. You think this temple, do you think this party is celebrating the eternal destruction of the second base of Mikdash? Watch this, Ahasuerus. Call Vashti. Ahasuerus says, hey Vashti. She doesn't come. Oh, he's furious. He kills Vashti. He marries Esther. He has a kid, Darius. He charges the people taxes. He dies. He gives all the money to Darius. And the party caused the building of the second temple. So Ahasuerus thought he was celebrating the destruction of the second base of Mikdash. And God made it, not only was He not celebrating the destruction, He was celebrating, preparing to rebuild the second temple. That's how God works. God says, I'm not afraid of Rishaim. We're, you're down here in this world, we get very nervous. Who's the president? Who's the prime minister? Who cares? God says, you give me the biggest Rasha, the biggest anti-Semite, the biggest Sonei Yisrael, and I use them as a pawn, as a puppet, to carry out Yeshuot V'nechamos to Klal Yisrael. That is why the grand finale of Megillat Esther is Ahasuerus taxes the people. He was celebrating this thing would never be rebuilt. And then at the end of the day, he's working for the UJA, collecting money to rebuild the second temple. But this concept repeats itself throughout history. Let me give you two examples. What's the biggest yeshiva in America? Lakewood. Lakewood. Who built Lakewood Yeshiva? Cutler. Rabbi Cutler to you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Rabbi Aaron Cutler. That's what people think. Else. I want to tell you who built the Lakewood Yeshiva. You know, there are other yeshiva also. I learned Yeshiva Chafetz Chaim. It's also Holy Yeshiva. Mir Yeshiva. Chaim Berlin. Tar Vadas. Yeshiva Darche Torah. A lot of great... What? Oh, Hel Simcha. This shul also, it's a holy makom Torah. Who built Torah in America? I'll tell you a story. 530 years ago, there was a couple, evil couple. They had a plan, they're going to purge the Iberian Peninsula from all the Muslim infidels and all the Jewish infidels. So they conquered the entire Iberian Peninsula. And then they said, as a reward to their so-called God, they're going to ex- um, expel 300,000 Jews from Spain. So King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella expelled on Thursday, April 2nd, Tisha B'Av, 1492, 300,000 Jews in gratitude to their so-called God. And the Jews were le- left. They went to Italy, they went to Mallorca, they went to Portugal, they went all over the world. Gibraltar. And we have a report from a boy, a cabin boy, who was leaving the port in 1492 on Thursday, April 2nd. And in the archives of Seville, it's recorded that this boy saw, he was being taken to be sold as a slave in Africa. This boy saw, parked in the dock, three boats. The Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. And he saw Christopher Columbus. And the next day, Friday, April 3rd, 1492, where was Columbus going? To, the, to, to discover the new world. And who paid for his expedition? Ferdinand and Isabella. And what did Columbus discover? The greatest haven in the history of the world for the Jewish people. Where more and bigger yeshivas were built than anywhere else in the world. Who discovered America? Ferdinand and Isabella. Who paid for the discovery? They did. Why did they pay? Because they thought they were expelling all the Jews from Spain, that the Jewish people would never have a homeland, they would never have a haven, they would never be able to practice the religion, they would never build yeshivot. So God said, really? You don't think the, yeshiv- the, the Jewish people will build yeshivot? You don't think they'll have a shul again? A Beit HaKneset, Jewish community? Not only will they, you're going to pay to discover it. And it's going to far surpass anything that ever existed in Spain, in the golden age of Spain, which you know, there was no golden age in Spain. It never happened. Lo haya nivra. It's a made up story. You know, it's like when we left Egypt and we said, oh, remember the sushi we ate in Egypt? Remember the cucumbers we ate in Egypt? There are no cucumbers in Egypt. But that's the Jew. When we leave the Gullus, we remember how great it was in, in the Gullus. It's not true. It's fantasy. There was no golden age of Spain. We had like a few minutes to breathe in between them trying to kill us. That was the golden age of Spain. When we went, (gasps) 
in between one guy trying to run after us with a sword and another guy trying to chop off our heads. That was the golden age of Spain. So who paid for the United States of America? Who discovered it? Why do we have the Lakewood Yeshiva? Who founded it? King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. In the last 200 years, who is the biggest enemy of the Jewish people? Which country? Hitler. Hitler, Ukrainians. It's a close bet. They, they all qualify to, for, for the great title. However, in the last 200 years, the Russians were probably the biggest enemy of the Jewish people. Already by 1920, 2 million Russian Jews left the country because in the, tw- in the 19th century, the Russians had a plan to murder all their Jewish citizens. Three-step plan. They were going to exterminate a third, expel a third, convert a third. So two million Jews left. In the last 60 years, who is the main funder of Arab aggression against Jews? Russia. Russia. Stalin killed 20 million people, but he thought that Hitler didn't do a good enough job and he was going to kill 2 to 4 million Jews that were left in Russia after World War II. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. You know, people think Hitler, the, the Germans, invented systematic extermination of Jewish people. No, no, the Russians did it. They were just a little bit slow. You know, in Russia, if you want to buy a new car, so you give the dealer $30,000, and he says, come back in 15 years and we'll give you the car. So the story goes, the guy said, okay, I'll come back in 15 years. Morning or afternoon, he says. He said, what do you care if it's morning or afternoon? It's 15 years. He said, I can't come in the morning. The plumber's coming in the morning. Right? That's how things work in Russia. So the Russians, they invented systematic extermination of Jewish people, and the Germans got it down. They perfected it. And yet, in 1947-1948, we were losing the war in Israel. And God put into the head of the biggest tyrant in Russia in history, Stalin killed 20 million people. What he did, he removed nations from country. He removed the tar. Nobody did what Stalin did. And then everybody swore allegiance to him. So now everyone's his Eved. <laughs> Who else had such control? Stalin got in his head. Oh, the Jews are losing the war in the Middle East. But then Britain will win. And I don't want democratic Britain in the Middle East. The Israelis, they're going to be socialists, so they'll be communists. I like communism in the Middle East. So who funded the War of Independence? Stalin. That was the turning point in the war. If not for Stalin, there would be no Mir Yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael, and no Hebron Yeshiva in Eretz Yisrael, and no Panovich in Eretz Yisrael, and no Brisk in Eretz Yisrael. And we wouldn't have the Kaisal HaMaravi, and Kever Rachel, and Ma'aras HaMachpela. Who did God use as a tool that we should have a homeland to build Tyre and Eretz Yisrael? The biggest Russia in history, Stalin. Why? That's how God operates. God says, you give me the Russia, you give me his plans, you give me his schemes, I'm not afraid of him. I don't need to knock him off, I will use him and you pull him like a puppet to bring about Yeshua v'nechamot to Kal Yisrael. Thank you, but don't steal my... I'm going to get... Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Achashverosh built the second base Hamikdash. Ferdinand and Isabella discovered the great country of the United States of America, greatest haven the Jewish people ever had. Stalin is responsible for the Eretz Yisrael that we have today. 1953, though, Stalin realized <laughs> Israel ain't going communist. So he, uh, he decided he's going to exterminate between 2 to 4 million Jews in, uh, Soviet, in Russia. His plan was he um, tried 6, 7, or 12 doctors. They were convicted of poisoning so-called Russian children. They were going to go to trial on March 5th. March 6th already, he had the railroad system in place to transport 3 million Jews in Russia to the Trans-Siberian area, Kazakhstan, where there were four concentration camps. And by the way, in Trans-Siberia, when it's negative 85 degrees below zero, all 3 million Jews would have been dead, chas v'shalom, in two weeks. 
That was the plan. The railroad systems were built. The railroads were there. The concentration camps were built. And he didn't have to do anything. No gassing, nothing. Just bring them to that region. And the date was February 28th, 1953, the day before Purim. Rabbi Yitzchak Zilber, the great Russian refusenik, was in a labor camp. And he says, you know, tonight is Purim, tonight we're going. If we had a Megillah, we would read the Megillah, we would read the story of how 2,500 years ago, God saved the Jewish people in Persia, and one Russian Jew who was already in prison for 10 years said, Rabbi, what are you telling me nonsense about what happened 2,500 years ago? That was Haman. This is Stalin. Stalin is an ox. Stalin will live forever. Stalin was strong like a mule. They thought he would live to be 195. And Rabbi Yitzhak Zilber said, yeah, Stalin is a, is, a, is a tough guy. But he's Basar Vadam. He's flesh and blood. Nobody knows what will be with it, even within 30 minutes. This is what Rabbi Yitzhak Zilber said at 7.50 p.m., right before the time they would, uh, would have read Megillat Esther. Now I want to tell you about another Russian refusenik, Reb Leib Maizlik, who taught Torah publicly, was incarcerated in solitary confinement. You know what solitary confinement is? They take a guy, they put him in the closet. You can't talk to anybody. You don't know if it's day or night. Not for a day, not for a week, for years. They took Rebbe Maizuk, they threw him in a prison. He didn't know if it was Yoim or if it was Laila. Only every day he got a slab of bread under the door and a pail of water. They said, how, how did you maintain your sanity? He said, I knew if I'm going to teach Torah publicly, they could come and get me any day. So I memorized Sefer Tehillim, and I memorized Mesechtot of Mishnayot, and that's what I did all day. I said Tehillim, and I reviewed Mishnayot. And he's there for two years. And in the city, his wife, now all his children already killed in the Holocaust. He had one surviving daughter. Nobody was allowed to talk to his wife and, and daughter. Nobody was allowed to look at them. If you winked at them, the Russians carry you away to Siberia. Who are they going to give Mishlach Manot to on Purim? The mother gave it to the daughter, the daughter gave it to the mother. That Purim morning, all of a sudden, Rebbe Maizlik, nobody brought him water, nobody brought him bread. He t- it's not locked. He opened the door. What happened? That night, 8.23 p.m., 33 minutes after Rabbi Yitzhak Zilber said, Stalin doesn't even know what's going to be in 30 minutes, he stroked that on Purim. Stalin stroked on Purim, 1953. Ten days before, he was going to eradicate three million Russian Jews. Rabbi Yitzhak Zilber said, I didn't know at first, can I pray for Stalin to die? He said he also knew the whole Tehillim Baal Peh, because when you're in labor camp, what are you going to do all day? He memorized the whole Tehillim. He did not stop saying Tehillim until he heard 10 days later on, February, on March 5th, Stalin died. A day before the trains were going to take 3 million Jews to be killed in Trans-Siberia. That poor morning, Rebbe Meislik's daughter and mother, they hear a knock on the door. Who's there? It's their father. They, 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 they didn't know if they were alive. They didn't know if they were alive. What happened? Stalin died. A thousand Jewish prisoners just walked out of jail and they're free. When did it happen? On Purim. Says Rav Moshe Feinstein, what's the name of the holiday? Purim. What does Purim mean? Purim means the lot. Why in the world would we name a, a Yom Tov over a, about a lottery? The lottery is what endangered our lives. Why would we name the Yom Tov after a lottery? The lesson of Purim is that a person's fate can change on a dime. You know, somebody once came to Ramosha Feinstein, they were for a bracha. And they said, said, what do you want a bracha for? He said, I want a bracha for Rafur Shalema. I want a bracha for a Shidduch. And Ramosha said, what about Parnasa? He said, no, I have Parnasa. He says, Ramosha said, that's what you need a bracha for. Because you think you have Parnasa. But in this world, things change on a dime. That's the lesson of Purim. Your success, we always have to pray. Even if a person is successful and 
he's doing well and is uh, being matzliach in a certain inyan, you have to be mispalel like you don't have it. But the reverse is also true. A person is in a matzav kasha. We believe by emunah shleima that just like that, Yeshuat Hashem keheraf ayin. Can you imagine? The Jewish people, they thought Mordechai was wearing sackcloth. So when they saw somebody riding through the street, riding on the royal horse, who did they think would be leading on the royal horse? They figured Mordechai is going to be leading Haman on the wild horse. And they could not believe what they're seeing. They said, what? Mordechai is on the horse? And Haman, second in command, he's leading the horse? What is this? Olam haba? It's Olam hafuch raisi. That's Purim, v'nahapochu. That the fate of the Jewish people can change on a dime. And it's happened before. And we pray every Matzoi Shabbat. La Yehudim, Haisa Oira, Vesimcha, Vesasain Vikar, Kain, Tihi Yalanu. We believe the Emunah Shleima. That all of these Sonei Yisrael, whether they're the premier of Russia today, whatever country they're in, North Korea, China, of course they don't like us. Yes, and they're very powerful. But just sit back, watch the show. The Ribbon Shalom uh, prefers those people. Those are the kinds of guys the Ribbon Shalom likes. You know why? Uh, the students of the Vilna Gaon explain. Because we live in the Galut. And in the Galut, there's not going to be the splitting of the Red Sea. Hashem is not going to make Makot. There's not going to be any open miracles. So how can we know for sure that it's the Ribbon Shalom orchestrating everything? It's this type of Hashkacha Pratit. Where Hashem says, you give me the Rasha, and I will use him to bring about Yeshuot for Klal Yisrael. That is the most incontrovertible, the clearest evidence that it's HaKadosh Baruch Hu pulling the strings. So when you see Achashverosh building the second temple, and the Spanish Inquisition discovering America, and Stalin assisting Klal Yisrael to regain Eretz Yisrael, then we know that behind all the hester panim, behind all the concealment, behind all the darkness, is the most brilliant light in the world. The light of Purim. The Arizal says that the Ur of Purim is more bright, is more brilliant than the light of Yom Tov, of Shabbat, of any holiday of the year. And therefore Chassam Sofer writes something incredible, and this is sourced in the Arizal. And it's almost impossible to say, and who could say such a thing if the Chassam Sober didn't say it? He says, Sheha'or Shekalul B'Megillat Esther. The light that is contained in Megillat Esther. Hu mamash yoter gadol mehatorah atzma. The light in the Megillah is actually greater, and this has to be understood, but there's a certain dimension. The light contained in Megillat Esther is greater than the light in the Torah itself. So we hope that through the merit of this holy day, HaKadosh Baruch Hu should bestow on all of us, on all of Klal Yisrael, on all of our families, on all of our communities, on each one of us, Shefa, Bracha, V'Hatzlacha, and Yeshuot, V'Nechamot, Lanu, L'Chol Yisrael, Amen. Thank you very much. Baruch Tia. Thank you, thank you. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.